Welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mayberry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. If you're just joining us, you're here for Geometry and Nature, the DNA of Design with Mark Rosenhaus, who's with a Rosenhaus Design Group based in New York City. We want to thank Kohler for generously sponsoring all of our webinars for the month of June. And Mark, I'm going to open up the mic and we can get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Rosenhaus, and the program is Geometry and Nature, the DNA of design, just like our own DNA. So thanks for Kohler for sponsoring this. Today we're going to learn about my favorite design topics, proportion, balance, sight lines, and inspiration. I have a degree in interior architecture, started out in architecture school at Kent State University, graduated Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And I've been designing kitchens since 1983. Uh, right now I live in New York City. I look out my bedroom window at the Chrysler building. I look out my living room window so I can see the fireworks display on the 4th of July and Thanksgiving. And then I walk out my door and there's the Empire State Building. I'm in Aries. I like changes, I like travel, I like excitement, I like different things. That's why I live in New York City. And you're gonna see that in these designs here. In talking about geometry and nature, these three items, your finger, a pineapple, and even the space shuttle are all designed on the same sense of proportions, and you're going to see that. You've probably all seen the circle around the man that da Vinci drew, Vitruvius man. You can start to see some of the proportions right there, 0.62 to 1, 162, 262. This is page one on golden rectangles and golden proportions. Now we're going to start with a little survey that I like to do, where you choose your favorite vertical shape and your favorite horizontal shape. There's no right or wrong. Just want to get an idea on which shape you like better in a vertical position and a horizontal position. And just so you know, the number five is a square. So I'll give you a minute or two to choose the image you like um, there's no right or wrong it's just what you happen to like and then we'll see at the end which shape was the most interesting and maybe the least interesting all right hopefully you've made your choices now the golden section, golden rectangle, golden ratio, sacred geometry are all based on the Fibonacci numbers, which is a series of numbers that a mathematician named Fibonacci realized way back during the Renaissance period. And it's a series of numbers that where you add consecutive numbers, you get the next one. Now let's see if you can figure out the pattern it's as easy as one and one is two. You need to know this because this is the basis for everything else we're gonna talk about. And when you divide adjacent numbers, like eight divided by 13, you get approximately 62%. Same thing with 21 divided by 34, and 144 divided by 233, and so on. They've carried this out to 4,000 places, and it keeps working. This is how you get the golden rectangle. If you start with a square, a one by one square, and then you take 62% of that, and you put a square on top, you're going to get a golden rectangle turned in the opposite direction, that's 62% of the width of the smaller rect square. And then you take that golden rectangle, you make a little square, 
you get another little golden rectangle, you find a square, you get a golden rectangle, you get a square, you get a golden rectangle. To get the spiral, you take a point on the opposite corner, draw an arc, opposite corner, draw an arc, and so forth, and that's how you get the spiral of the Nautilus seashell. It's the same spiral as the galaxies and the Milky Way. It's also the same spiral as the back of your fist. You take a look at the back of your fist, the thumb running around to the index finger is the same spiral. And the same proportions happen amazingly to the planet Saturn. You look at the dimensions of 0.62 to is 62% of the size of the globe. And the same with the opposite side. It's one plan for the entire universe. A little bit easier way to make a whole universe. And if you're going to outer space, you might as well have something that's in proportion as well. So you have the width of the wings is in about a 62% relationship to the length of the entire space shuttle. If you start out thinking of those proportions, you're going to be close before you even have to think of anything else size-wise. It's not your final design. It's not your first design, but it's your way to get it close to the beginning to make it easier. In nature, you take plants like a, a sunflower and you count the little pods in a clockwise direction and then in a counterclockwise direction. In the clockwise direction, you follow this curve around and you count the little pieces at the end, and you'll see there are 34. Then if you go in a counterclockwise direction, you count 30, 55 going all around. It's not the same. It's also not the same for a pineapple. We're going to count counterclockwise and clockwise, and you'll see what happens. Ah, that didn't work. Uh, somehow, ah, I'm going to have to skip it. It's too bad. Um, a fish also has the same proportions. If you look at the, the tail end of the fish, that's one. And then the main body is 1.618, which is a little finer than the, six point, or the, the 0.62. And then from the top of the fish to the opening of his mouth is 62% of the overall height. Even the way birds fly. Now, nobody told them this except nature. So if you look at this, they have one, one, two, five, three, one, five, three, eight, and two. Those are all Fibonacci number groupings. This was just a random photo that a friend of mine took. I saw it and I said, this has the golden proportions. Even the way our money has changed. It used to be that the face was in the exact center, but some years ago they moved it so that the focal point, the eye or this eyebrow was at 62% of the overall width. Now, another thing that you're gonna see proportion wise is horizontal is a different feeling than a vertical. So the horizontal, if you have a relationship of oh, about 225 to almost three times the width of the height, you're going to find a very pleasing shape. We'll see what happens in your survey at the end. An easy way to remember the 62% proportion is to look at your finger. And if you look at your finger while we're looking at the screen, your first digit is 62% of the second digit. And the second digit is 62% of the third digit. So the first two equal the third. And you can measure that on your own finger. So everything you need to know is right there. Great proportions in the Statue of David. From the floor to his navel is 62% of his height. Now, this is for men. Women are a little bit different. So men, if you wanted to see if you have perfect proportion, get somebody to measure you from floor to your navel, compare to your height, and see where you are. I measured myself. I have a torso and arm span of somebody taller than I really am, 
because I have short legs. In a perfect face, you've got a square from her chin to the top of her eyebrows from cheek to cheek. A golden rectangle goes up to the top of her head. Now, if you measure from her chin to the middle of her mouth, that's 62% of from the middle of her mouth to the underside of her eye, from the underside of her eye to the top of her eyelashes is also 62%. And left to right, it's cheek to the corner of the mouth compared to the width of the mouth. Now, if you draw a diagonal straight through, it's going to intersect right at the tip of her nose, in which case then you go from there to the corner of her mouth and a perfect radius for the shape of her lip. She is one of thousands that I've looked at that has a perfect face. Now, why do we find beauty in this proportion? It's because the DNA, our DNA, is also built on the 62% proportion. Look at the way the waves hit their maximum arc between 62% to 100%. Now, if we were ET, we might have a different DNA and somebody might look different to us. Also, when you walk, you're using that 62% proportion. Now, a regular stride is about half your height. When you walk with a purpose, you get 62% of your height, give or take a little bit, depending on the length of your leg and how strong you're walking. Something we do absolutely every day, walking up steps. The tread is 11 inches, the riser is seven, seven and 11 is a 62% relationship. Even the way we build Stonehenge from many, many years ago also has 62%. And this is how they told, tell, told time back then. Um, you've got the uh, blue stone horseshoes in the center, which are 62% from the edge compared to the distance between them. The Parthenon has the width of the, the front facade, 62% of what it was at the peak when it was first built. Why are Greek urns considered so beautiful? Because they have proportions. You can see the upper third and the lower third are 62% of the center section. And the artist gives you clues as to where his decorations are. Even across the top, where the opening of the mouth of the jug is 11.6 compared to the entire width of 17.5, golden portions. I'm showing you all these things so you can get an idea on how prevalent it is in everyday life and the how they knew it years and years ago and probably you will do it years and years from now. You probably never look at the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building same way again. Again, you look at the, the dimensions here that 115 meters and the 210 equals the 325. The 115 to the 210 is 62% relationships. The Empire State Building is a little tougher to look at because you can't stand back. But if you take a look at this upper section where the red square is delineated, you'll see that you take diagonal lines from the top center to the corners and they intersect right at this point here, which is part of a golden rectangle. And if you were to start from the center down here, you go up on a diagonal, it would hit that same point. Most of the Empire State Building below it is just straight up, but the exciting part, the focal point, is all the way at the top. If you drive across the George Washington Bridge between New Jersey and New York, you'll also see the same proportions. If you count those X grids going up, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, five and eight, golden proportions. Even in low-income housing, a block away from where I work on 88th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, the architect put golden proportions, Fibonacci sequence right there. 
He's got one here, which he lowered it just for some emphasis. This is twice the width, then three, five, and then back to three, two, and one. All Fibonacci sequence numbers. I'm sure the people who live here don't have any idea, but I look at this virtually every day and I marvel at the simplicity of it. My favorite, balance. There's axial or mirror symmetry, and then there's dynamic symmetry. For me, dynamic symmetry is much more exciting. It adds vitality and movement to design. As you probably remember when you were on a seesaw when you were kids, the heavier person had to be closer to the fulcrum so that it balances with the lighter weight person at the end. Now you go up and down a little bit, but eventually at some point you get to be balanced. And this becomes the lively part of design. Here's something that's axial or mirror symmetry. You basically have a square in the center, but on either side, you have a shape that's not a golden rectangle, not a square. It's kind of in between the netherland of interesting, pleasing proportions. However, at Trevi Fountain, which I'm sure you've been to if you've been to Italy, it has proportions where you'll have the center square and then golden rectangles on either side. And to get the idea, to get to know what the width of the center square is, you take the overall length and you divide by 2.24, which happens to be 0.621 and 0.62 added together. This is a very useful number when you want to get to the center and then whatever's left over, you divide that in half. This pagoda has a lot going on. It has horizontals, it has verticals, it has diagonals, and I'll show you a few of them. So you have 62% of the height up to this railing, and then the rest 38 from the railing to the top. When you go from the top and you draw some diagonal lines to this column over here and the mirror column over on this side, you have the area where you can put the circle. Now that circle is based on the center rectangle. Now the center rectangle, the width to the height, is a 2.3 ratio. A little squatty for me, but it's okay. You'll find that the bottom of the circle is halfway up the height, just where your eye is on a face. And if you take the green diagonal lines, that will hit at corners where the orange triangle hits, which is right on the railing, or here, which is where these little window panes are, or here, where it's the top of the door, and that's delineated by the rectangle, the blue rectangle at the bottom, which has a 2.3 to 1 ratio. The Taj Mahal. More than just skin deep, more than just the marble facade. You look at and find the proportions where you have, it's all built within a, a square. You take diagonal lines, the purple to the center, the diagonal lines, uh, yellow to the bottom, and where they cross is where the golden rectangle is right over here and another one on the opposite side where it, the yellow line crosses the red down below, that delineates your square, which also happens to be the same line that goes from the, the middle at the bottom all the way up to the corner. And then the golden rectangle of the center area hits where the purple line does. This is what you do when you're putting your designs together, and I'll show you some more. Even just where the finial is, is delineated where the purple lines intersect. I use it here in this kitchen wall where I started out with a square in the center, 42 by 42, which left 27 inches on either side. 27 by 42 is a golden rectangle. Within that golden rectangle is a 27 by 27 square. 
and a 15 or 27 by 15 rectangle above that. When I told the two guys that their cabinets had the same proportions as the Taj Mahal, how do you think they felt? Cabinets are more than just boxes. They can be sculpture, they can be design, they have some meaning. And then also the width to the height relationship. This is 96 across by 42 high. 96 divided by 42 is 2.29, still within the framework that I find is a pleasing horizontal. The Cathedral of Notre Dame has been in the newspaper quite a bit. Here you will see the spire before it burnt down. And here again, we have golden proportions. We have the entire unit is a golden proportion. Up to this point is a square. You draw diagonals across and it gives you one of the tangents to the rosette from this sculpture to the opposite high corner. It gives you the other tangent and that tells you where it is. There are so many other guiding lines between points of important interest that you could have a lot of fun for a long time. I use it here in this kitchen as well. There's a microwave and a grill. There's an air conditioner behind the grill. I could have made that grill any size I wanted, but I know that if I have a golden rectangle here and one on the opposite side, I draw a diagonal line and it will hit at the point of the ceiling. And that gives you a very attractive wall to look at. Now, most people probably won't notice the difference, but now that you know, you're gonna look for it. Here's balance that's ah, in a, a sense like on a seesaw. The ballerina in the arabesque position, she's balanced, but it's certainly not equal objects on either side of a line. And Will Downing showing you what balance can be where he has his hat in the shorter version and his long arm balances where his actually his head or his legs might be. I did the same for this kitchen over here where you have a golden rectangle on the left, a golden rectangle turned sideways on top and a square with the double horizontal doors on the right. And you can see that there's more space on the right of the refrigerator than on the left. We call this the helicopter because it looks like it could be twirling around. In this wall unit, where there be a dining table sitting right in front, again, we've got lots of play between double squares, a golden rectangle, two individual squares, another golden rectangle sitting on top of the timbre door, and then four square doors on the bottom. So if you're going around, you can do this like you had your train set when you were a kid where you had this, the oval and then you had the inside circle you could go to. So you could keep changing anywhere you wanted to go and it became interesting. Or you go the opposite way and you get something a little different. For some people, this is too busy. For other people, it's just right. Here's again where I can show you how when you have the right proportions, you can double check yourself. This is the schematic of this wall over here. This is a golden rectangle. This is a golden rectangle. The whole wall is a golden rectangle sideways. This piece here with the three is also a golden rectangle. You have this section, that's a golden rectangle as well. And you know you've got all the proportions right because when you draw diagonal lines, they intersect right where your eye wants to go. Had I made these skinnier or shorter for any one of these, the lines might intersect up here or over here. And you'd look at it and you say, it looks good, but uh, I'm not quite sure. But when you have the proportions right, there's no doubt. You can also do the same thing with your knobs and handles. You take 62% of the 100% that goes in between, you draw a diagonal line, and you find a convenient corner to, to diagonalize it to, if I can use that word, and it'll tell you where to put the handles. Or you go the opposite way and you go from the corner through where the handles are, and it'll tell you where the knobs are gonna go. It's all visually wonderful, and most cases it's physically 
worthwhile as well. Frank Lloyd Wright, he uses proportions as well, and it's different sizes, so you're not looking at the same thing. Why do you want to go from point A to point B and see the same thing? So you have one proportion that's 62% of the second, which is 62% of the third. And here he also goes where you can go up on top and around, you can go here, you can go on the inside. It makes it very interesting. This is Falling Waters if you've ever been there. In the Roby House in Chicago, he shows proportions as well. You've got 50% of the overall width to the chimney. You have 62% to the peak of the 100% of the entire structure. One of my favorite designs because it has so much movement, the eaves that go across on different planes, different sizes. Um, it's where I get some inspiration, in which case I use it in this display where you have 18 to 30 to 48, which are all in the Fibonacci sequence or golden proportions. You have the 24 inch square fitting into a 24 by 39 golden rectangle, which would leave you with another golden rectangle left over. Now, in the 96 inches by 36 inches, you get a 2.67 ratio, which I find extremely pleasing. And then again, you can go around and up to the top or around and in here, go around in different directions, whichever you want to go. The angled cabinet is because I can. Other people like it the same way. Here you have 18, 30, and 48. And what happens here is in design, if you want to create the focal point and movement, you start with the heavy object over against the wall and you get lighter as you go across where you have the three doors, then the recessed two doors, and then the open shelves here because the rest of the room moves in this direction. A third person, we have 21 with the glass door, the angle cabinet, three doors at 55. Then you have a 48 inch square and a 30 by 48 inch glass cabinet, all working within golden proportions. And the last one, straight across, again, you've got three on the heavy, getting lighter and getting lighter as you go across. A third time, now you can even do it in traditional where you have 21, 34 and the space for the hood. And I leave space around there because you know, you want to have the hood to breathe. You know, there's air flowing around. Give it some elbow room. It's a beautiful hood. You want to have it as a focal point. You want to see the tile work on both return sides. And then you take your guiding lines again from the top of the hood, drawing it to the opposite countertop, and it goes through where the knobs are or the front edge of the hood going to the front edge of the diagonal countertop. Those start cutouts are also in proportion. That's another story. The greatest bit of geometry that I actually did. Guiding lines are in paintings as well. You'll probably never look at this painting again now that I'm going to show you the secrets to what George Seurat was having you follow. You start with the man right here. He's going to look tangent to this umbrella and tangents to umbrellas is a theme. It goes up to the, the tree, straight down along the edge of the umbrella. You have tangent to this umbrella and you wind up with a square. You take the diagonal from the square, you go through the tangent of this umbrella through the knob of his walking stick, diagonally through the two girls, through the square to the dog's tail and the dog's nose sitting on that line. There are many more uh, lines to follow, but you wouldn't see the picture. I spent three hours having fun deciphering everything that he was doing. Making order out of chaos, which is what 
the guiding lines do and the proportions do. You take this very dynamic sculpture and you put proportions in it so that it makes sense. You start with um, where his eye is, and that's 62% of the width to where perhaps his son is looking. And then you take that diagonal line and you go down to his feet, which is straight through the focal point to that eye. Then you have from his eye to his elbow, and that's 62% to the outside of the main part. And if you take the whole diagonal again, like I said, you go straight across, straight down. This is your intersecting point. There are green lines showing you other things as well. It's a fantastic sculpture for one and proportional layout for another. Johann Vermeer uses the same idea to balance the chandelier, which is not in the center of the painting. You start with the, the curtain. It goes down to the corner. You draw a diagonal line through the woman's hand and then through the, um, the upper part of the wall hanging, and that gives you the left side of the chandelier. He gives you another point where you go through his leg, his shoulder, and up to that point at the curtain, and that double checks where this left side of the chandelier is. The right side of the chandelier, the clue is through the, the stool, through the easel up at the top, to the point virtually at the top of the wall hanging. And then you take the easel on the right side through the upper portion of the easel, and where they intersect is right where the right side of the chandelier is. And then an, a third one from the corner of the wall hanging up to the top in the center, and there you have it. He's got it all figured out. It's all balanced, but it's not mirror symmetry. I take the circle around the man that you saw early on, Vesuvius, uh, Vitruvius, sorry, and it gives you the, the curvature of the cabinet over here. I could have made this curve any size I wanted to, but there's a way to figure out the right curve. And if you look at this, the points at the top of the cabinets and the bottom of these cabinets makes a perfect circle. So it gives you just what you're looking for. And then the diagonal lines, one, two, three, four, five, which goes to one, two, uh, three, the middle, and then the lower corner. And then you can go the other way as well. It's all there. It all works. Try it. As interior designers, you're hanging paintings and shelves and pictures on the wall and plates and sizes of um, lamps and such. You draw a diagonal line and you'll find your guiding lines to all the points. Sure, the picture's probably gonna be centered over the couch, but not always. Um, but at least it gives you a starting point for placing the other objects and they're balanced. So you know that one object is not too high or too low. I did the same thing with this wall unit here. New York City, we have tall ceilings so we could go pretty high. And in arranging the paintings on the wall, I made diagonal lines from the top of the TV, and then the pictures hit at sometimes the same line. We have one, two, and three. This picture happens to hit this one at the same time. It depends on the size of the paintings, but you work on it. Yes, this could have been up or down a little bit more, but you start to see what works. Probably the spacing here is in relation to the spacing over here. Matisse puts a lot of motion and movement into the, the dance. It's life, it's not just looking at a, a still life of flowers or fruit. There's life and there's action. You wanna keep looking, you look at each individual figure and see what their positions are the tension between the two hands trying to clasp each other in the center. Uh, it's, it's all wonderful. It keeps going and, and you go different ways. And you'd think that's, oh, like maybe dancing the horror, well, they'll 
move in towards each other and move away to each other. It has a pulse, it's movement. And Mondrian does the same thing with rectangles and squares. If you start with the red square, which is 62% of the width of the paintings, then you go down to the lower square, you step to the, the black small one, up to the blue and up to the yellow, you have that spiral motion. I use the same thing in this very tiny kitchen here to have some fun with some color and to show people that, yes, it's a very tiny kitchen and I can do something with it where they come in and they usually say, oh, I got this small kitchen. You really can't do anything with it. Well, I wind up having a whole lot of fun and fun is the point. You know, you don't have to be serious. You want to have a lot of fun with it. Here's the same spiral motion. You're going around and around where you go from here and around and you come down to the triple doors. Now, here I'm showing you how to make a glass cutout of a certain size, which happens to be in a 62% proportion to the size of the door. So if you take the width of the door, which is 18 inches, divide by 2.24, you get eight, which is the width of the glass. The remaining 10 inches is five inches on either side. You would do the same thing with the vertical dimension, although you don't even have to, because if you draw a diagonal line through it, where they cross the horizontal is the same proportion. Again, if you take the height, divide by 2.24, you'll find out what the size of the glass is. The glass doesn't have to be any one particular size to have the proportions that you would want. Up here, you've got a square within a square. You have a golden rectangle within a golden rectangle. You have little squares which are placed halfway up the height of the door, which is the same spot that your eye is on your head. The bottom of your eye is halfway the height of your head. This one here happens to have no glass in it because they want to just reach in and move things around. Another feature that I like to talk about, which really has nothing to do with proportion, except it has to do with placement, and that is to group items together that have the same material, especially in a small kitchen where you may have appliances and cabinets of the equal number. Pick one, either put a panel on the appliance that matches the cabinet, or you put a panel or doors on the cabinet to match the appliances. So here you have all stainless steel going up, forming a shape with the dark cabinets here, and then the angle of the blue glass uh, as the backsplash. It's like uh, instruments in an orchestra. You don't see woodwinds mixed in with the percussions. They're all in their own section, so you get a much better sound. Here again, you have the proportions of a square door in glass, sliding glass doors so that you have some movement around. The backsplash has movement as well. And the contractor was with me all the way to get the perfect curve because if you move one tile an eighth of an inch, you got to move all the others an eighth of an inch as well. More movements, sliding glass doors, spiral around, spiral back different depths because I can. And that all has to do with the, the beams that are flying all over the place. And then the glass hole doesn't have to be a square. It could be a circle. Again, it's halfway up the height of the height of the door. And then the swerve where this dimension is 62% of this dimension, where they intersect is halfway up, which is right through here. More um, inspiration, Brancusi's bird in flight with this beautiful smooth curve, taking that curve from the kitchen that you saw before and making a door on a major curve plus the side of the cabinet, leaves the whole cabinet open so you can see the multi-colored -light, light uh, wine area and then to show all the things that she wants to see. The flow of probably one of the most famous paintings, Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, shows spirals and flows and just wonderful movement that you would see in the sky, which gets me to 
the flow and movement of dance where you're up and then flowing down. And the same thing with this wall unit. And this wall unit is in the same room as the lady who just had the big curving wine rack. And to make it a little more interesting, each box is 10% smaller than the next one, going from left to right, where on the left side, it's against the wall and it's open on the right side. Interestingly enough, the 62% point is right where this divider is, right in the middle of these two. I didn't really know that until after I was double checking my sizes and became really interesting. It looks like it might be the focal point. Well, actually it is the focal point, but it's not the midpoint. The uh, track lighting was there from the beginning, so we never changed that. How about some more spirals in nature? The lizard with the same spiral that I put on as a wrought iron spiral onto the cabinets. The cabinets are a full golden rectangle left to right, and there's a square with a golden rectangle next to it, and all the curve follows and keeps getting smaller and smaller. And if I could put the, the guiding lines on it, you'd see there's a, a square in the lower section and a golden rectangle up on top. Designing furniture has meaning. The curve of the back, just like in the spiral, starts in the opposite corner, it gives you the radius. This curve down below starts in the middle and it curves right around here. If you're looking at it head on, the upper cushion and the lower cushion are both perfect squares. And I'm sure you sat on this chair um, many times in office buildings and such, uh, the Barcelona chair. So the next time you see it, take a look. And actually the tufting also has uh, squares. Having fun with different uh, configurations of shapes, circles, squares, parallelograms, in the same way that the stancer is balanced, he's balanced on one foot, but he's certainly not uh, mirror imagery or mirror uh, balancing. The same thing with the Malovic uh, paintings on the side here. And I use that in this situation as well. These are just the Fibonacci sequence of whirling squares, where this is one, two, three, five, eight, and 13 to give you that wonderful spiral movement. This is a bathroom wall in a shower. And then, and I'm sorry, this is on the floor. This one's in the shower where it's one, two, three, five, eight, 13, and then 21. Now we didn't fill it in because 21 by 21 is uh, over three square feet. And these little tiles cost $100 a square foot. So this would have been an expensive uh, tile wall. But the tiling as an outline gives you enough of the feel for it. Tension. Be Rudolf Nureyev with his arms going, pointing down strenuously to the woman and the way her leg is angled going towards the corner and Nureyev's arms and shoulders going towards the opposite corner. And then the uh, couple up in the right where the woman's legs are pointing to the lower left corner, it's directly at the man's arms and in his finger pointing up to the corner. Interestingly, if you would have followed his arm, it doesn't go to the corner, but that subtle movement of his finger Almost the kind of same thing as God and Adam in the Sistine Chapel where they're about to touch together. Hopefully you've seen or heard about Zaha Hadid. She was an architect of fantastic creativity. Um, she died last year at the age of 69 from a heart attack. But look her up, you'll see some of the most fantastic shapes and curves and the dynamic movement that she puts into this, um, I believe it's a museum in Germany. You follow this diagonal line and you get right up to the point. And in all these diagonal lines, uh, I asked her if I could show you this picture in my presentation and through her representative a few years ago, she said yes, because I get my inspiration from this to do things like this 
where if you follow the, the little knobs and you follow the handles, it gives you that diagonal and the diagonal is the longest point between any portion. And it's the, the most exciting thing you could do. Sorry about that. Um, and there's a diagonal or an angle here because the kitchen's really tiny. And then Frank Geary's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, all the little twists and turns I put into this piece of sculpture here. The circle in the stainless steel is a working door. The glass door lifts up straight. The upper right, that's just a fake, um, but you get the whole idea. And then the, the bottom is built out to 48 inches to give her some more countertop in this tiny little kitchen. Refrigerators on the adjacent wall. Now, here's a little recap before we end everything. And you can take this and look at it at home again, but it's a recap of the golden proportion Fibonacci sequence, how to do the golden rectangle, how to see it on your finger, a beautiful face, as you look at buildings and balance of seesaw, more buildings to see, mirror symmetry, how you can use it in your kitchen, um, how you take the dynamic symmetry in the lower left kitchen, uh, how you can make spirals and movements and figure out the sizes of glass doors so they don't have to be just a frame for glass. And then the pagoda on the right with lots of information. Now, Maybe Debbie can tell us what the uh, uh, survey says on the. Uh, um... Yes. All right. Thank you, Mark. Survey says <laughs> <laughs> for vertical. Um, so when everyone is uh, asked the questions from one to five, which image did they like for vertical? Uh, for number one, it was 5%. For number two, it was 10%. For number three, it was 20%. Number four was nine percent, and number five was eight percent. Um, That's a surprise. And then you want me to do yeah, and well, there were some folks that that didn't answer, but that was, I would say, probably half half the people that answered okay. that were with us at the moment. And then for the hor horizontal um, side, so five percent answered A, uh, ten percent answered B, eleven percent answered C, eleven percent answered D. And 12% answered E. Hmm. Interestingly enough, because number four is a golden rectangle. And the middle three horizontals are within the 2.25 to 2.9 uh, width to height relationship. So I'm surprised. But anyway, we'll move on. As we're going to finish up with a biophilic fairy tale where we start with some rain to water the plant, the wind the, and the lightning um, are going to blow the clouds until the sun comes out and you have a blue sky with a rainbow and a pot of gold. And then we have SpongeBob underneath the sink, bubbles underneath the dishwasher, and an R2-D2 moving remote control garbage can to roll all around the house. Here's uh, a reading list, my contact information, and thank you for listening and watching. Well, thank you so much, Mark. This has been so inspiring and, and quite interesting, I, I think. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Good. Um, so there was a question, and we are opening the floor up, by the way, to questions. Once again, I want to thank you, Mark, for this great presentation and to thank Kohler for their sponsorship for the month of June for our webinar series. So there was a question here and I'm going to read it to you. I'm, this person says, I'm finding the upper tilted cabinets. Now this was a while back in the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm finding the upper tilted cabinets awkward to look at. My eye wants them to tilt in at the top and out at the bottom. <laughs> Is there a proportion or balance reason for this? The reason it tilts back in my mind, because cabinets start at the front dimension and they go back at the bottom dimension. Now, you're not the only person who said that they think it should go back, but to me, it should go back at the bottom so you have more nose clearance. And especially if you're gonna put it over a stove or you have shallower countertops in front of it. 
Um, yeah, there are old cabinets that I remember when you go to like these Revolutionary War um, reconstructed um, places, and they have uh, cabinets that have the upper portion going back. Um, even like these, um, uh, was it tornado shelters that you would go into the basement, where it seems like the it goes back at the tilts back at the back. Um, but uh, ah, okay, that's the way you see it. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so if there are other questions, please put them into the chat now, so that I can. Get All right. Them. Now, if anybody wants to get in touch with me. Um, if you don't do it by Friday, I'm taking a two week vacation and then I'll be back. I'm going to my favorite place. I'm going to Africa where I was 39 years ago. This time I'm taking my two uh, grown children. Thank sounds, you very much. Sounds awesome. Well, um, if there are no more questions, uh, everyone is saying so, they love the curves and designs that you um, put into this presentation. It's been great. And Mark, I want to thank you for your time today and for putting all this material together and having everybody take a look at something in a completely different way. That was pretty inspiring, I think. And I want to thank all of you out there for attending today and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.